My guest today is one of my favorite people in the world, and my life is so much better for knowing him. Miguel Cervantes stars in the Chicago production of Hamilton as Alexander Hamilton himself and is a fabulous father to two amazing children. He is also my husband. And that is why he is the perfect guest to talk about being married with children with epilepsy. Thanks for joining me today, babe. Thank you for having me. <laughs> so I don't think that anyone would disagree that having children changes a relationship. Um, and then you throw in a child with special needs or epilepsy and that sort of throws it all on its head. What do you think the biggest change in our relationship has been since Adelaide was diagnosed? In remembering how it was with Jackson, with, with, our, with our son, uh, anybody who has kids can attest to how, you know, selfishness becomes a second, secondary thought right. and you're now 100% focused on taking care of this person, this new person. So when Adelaide came along, you know, I think it's going to be that again. And I think that's going to be the hard part of our relationship to say, okay, well, here's another baby. Now that we finally got this other one into a good rhythm and as we can figure out how we live our life around his schedule, this new baby comes in and we have to go back to that other version of, um, you know, okay, new baby, we're up at night, da, 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 all these things about how uh, just, you know, sort of becoming a parent changes things. And then as we were learning about, I think, what her situation was going to be and how that was going to be different than the last time. There's a, a, the, a new stress of parenting, right? A new stress of how do we stay, you know, positive with each other, not just because, oh, she doesn't have time for me because she has to take care of the kid or she doesn't have time for me because, or we don't have time to do this because, you know, the babies are, need us, but now it's, we don't have time to do this because we're going to the hospital, or we don't have time to do this because we're worried about what is going to happen to her. And there's such a different um, mental place to be in when it's, it's not about just regular life things, and it becomes about the health and livelihood of this child. So the carefree moments that we had um, when our child finally went to sleep or the carefree moments that we could find when, you know, someone took our child to babysitter or something weren't as carefree anymore. And I think mm -hmm. it made it a little bit less easy to drop our, our parenting guard. And, and now, you know, we're even in our carefree moments, in the back of our mind, we have this baby who is clearly sick and, you know, that doesn't go away. You mentioned something that really struck me, which was, you know, you, there's different stages of parenting in terms of like, you know, how you parent with a newborn and the amount of tension that that newborn, and then it's sort of, you know, your relationship changes as a child gets older, but Adelaide has never really gotten much past that newborn phase. So on top of her requiring all of these additional medical needs or our family being separated because she's in the hospital, there's, we have been in a newborn phase for three years of, you know, waking up in the middle of the night and needing to tend to her and make sure that she's okay. And which adds another challenging element. We don't ever get to grow out of that. When Jackson was growing up and he was a baby, the, the, we would wake up, we would get, someone would have to get out of bed, he'd be crying, he'd be screaming, we'd go put him down and all of those things. And now our wake-ups are, you know, an alarm going off right. because she's not breathing correctly or, you know, is she having a seizure right now? I remember being so frustrated with Jackson, just go to sleep, just go, please, just, and then, you know, that was our stress. Mm -hmm. We always yeah. had to wake up. We always got up and had to worry about what was, he That's was true. doing. <clears throat> but now it's a different, it's a different version. The life and death version, like the, the it's just so amped yeah. to another level. It's not just the annoyance of wanting to get a full night's sleep or spend time together. It is, 
the you know the fear and anxiety that goes along with hearing those alarms or yeah. hearing her cry out and wondering if she's crying because she just had a seizure. Um, I think that our life has also been incredibly enriched by having Adelaide and and being exposed to to this world and community and and seeing parenting through eyes that we had never imagined. In in what ways for you? Um, do you feel that our marriage has grown as a result of Adelaide and, and her epilepsy? I think we are staring adversity in the face every day, and we are a team, like the teamwork aspect of our marriage. While never was a problem, I think... You it's certainly been tested. Yeah, yeah, but I think you see <laughs> that... Got to work out. You see that when you really need to be a team, when you really need to come together, um, and it's not just... I'm so mad at you, it's, you know, we need to keep our daughter alive or we need to keep our family together. Um, that's when the real testament to our sort of, you know, team, team math, the teamwork, the Cervantes team really comes together. And I think that's, you know, you don't get to test those things very often in you know, a normal track when you have kids that are just living regular lives. And I think, I think we, have been given the opportunity to really dig in and say, are we going to be strong enough to get through whatever's coming? And clearly we're so far so good. Parlaying that, um, one of the things that I think that we do very well in order to maintain that teamwork is communication. Um, you know, whether it's just laying in bed at night and just checking in with each other and making sure that we're on the same page with both Adelaide's medical condition, you know, medical decisions that are going on or care or things that are going on with Jackson, but just, you know, we don't talk every day about it, certainly, but those, you know, weekly or biweekly talks that we have just laying in bed at night, I don't know what I would do without those. Those just keeping that communication path open. In any relationship, I think, there has to be um, a communication and in our relationship even more so because the way that we have sort of structured our day-to-day -day activities. Well, and I would argue that there has to be incredible structure. Yeah. You know, when you're dealing with a child who is on a lot of meds and I mean, goodness gracious, Adelaide's schedule with her therapies and her doctor's appointments and this and that and making sure that the prescriptions are refilled, that really has to be one person's responsibility. Otherwise, you're gonna end up with the child getting the same meds twice. Something that we've done well sometimes more weller than others and sometimes <laughs> less better than less good but understanding where our each other's weaknesses are and accepting that and saying that's okay we're because the larger the larger picture is the most important one and that's how we get through a day or a week or a month and the next year and the next two every whatever happens understanding that we are that we are accepting of each other no matter what I think that is such an incredibly valid point. I don't think I've um, heard you articulate that or thought of that myself, but I, it's incredibly true. Uh, I don't know if you remember, of course you remember, but um, <laughs> you were working and I, you were going to work every morning and I was not, and I was taking care of the house and these things and I was going to these appointments. This and was right when Adelaide was first diagnosed. Right when Adelaide was diagnosed and so we would go to these, and I went to talk to this geneticist, and there was this little guy, and he was telling me all these things, and he gave me these papers, and he said this and this, and he said all these words, and I said, yeah, uh, okay, yeah, yeah. And then I came home, and you said, did you write it down? Did you bring the papers home? Where's the folder? Did you? I said, ah! So <laughs> clearly, our, our roles in this situation, I, I had the wrong role. Well, I think it's sort of what you said. We ha you have to be aware of your partner's strengths and weaknesses. I am neurotically organized, and you are not. So it makes more sense yeah. if yeah, I remember that. I remember taking over Adelaide's medical care when you booked Hamilton and you started going into rehearsals. And I was like, okay, where are all of Adelaide's papers? Where are all the tests? And you're like, oh, it's in the office. On so a pile of papers. I open up the door to the office and I look on the desk and it was, I mean, just papers everywhere. Yeah. And I had a, a mild panic attack and then I got in the car and went and picked up office supplies and got everything organized over the course of the next two days. Um, so, but uh, yeah, I think that it's, 
it really goes back to that that excellent point you made where you just have to you know be aware of of what each of you does best and doesn't do well and and not get mad at the other person for not being great at you know what you know is is not their strong suit um, your your child your family member with special needs with epilepsy is always in the back of your mind and you, you try and go out, go to events, go have date nights. But how do you manage that without feeling distracted while we're out or, or feeling guilty for stepping away? It's never not part of the way that I view my life. You know, if, if we get a chance to go somewhere else, and it's not some event that's about epilepsy or special needs. Or, <laughs> and don't get me wrong, they're all very nice events, but you know, if it's something that's not, that has nothing to do with that, or has nothing to do with our daughter, or nothing to do, because you know, the other half of our life is not them. Yeah. Even if she was running around you know, uh, like a regular kid, we would, we would also need to have those kind of nights where we don't worry about her or, or them or what's gonna happen. Because it is what it, what's going to happen is going to happen. It is what it is. You know, we are not we are not changing the course of her life, one way or the other, by going to, to going to see a movie. Right. We are not going to affect how good or bad her next seizure is going to be by going to have dinner. And you know, I I think maybe because I do that on stage all the time, I sort of I'm always sort of I can. I compartmentalize what's happening in my that brain. That's going to be my next question is, you know, you, you know, six nights a week, seven shows a week, you leave our house and you, you know, go off to the theater and, or, you know, sometimes we're in the hospital and you're going off to work. Like life doesn't stop. You, they still, you know, the show must go on as they say. So how, how do you do that? Cause I'm, I'm with her all the time. You know, I may run errands yeah. here or there, we have the nurse, but you know, you, you leave and you know, you have to, um, we need you to, but how, is that a relief for you? Does it, is it hard? Like what? I, I think I would be lying if I didn't say it was absolutely a relief. Now, I don't go to the theater and be like, whoa, I'm out of here. <laughs> give it, give it. It's not like that. It's, I think it's more of a relief of, um, Focus, you know, a relief of, of just the reminder. Um, For the first year or so of you doing that show, I resented you yeah. immensely yeah. because you got to escape. Yeah, and, and you I know, didn't. and I go out, to, I go to this building, and I hang out with, and I hang out with grownups that are doing other things, and life is happening around, and and you know, just some sort of other stimuli that's not focused completely on our sick daughter is a relief. Now, it's, I mean, I go to work; it's right. going to my job. Um, it's a very cool job. I get to do a lot of cool things, but nonetheless, it is the, it's my job, and I go hang out with. I, I'm surrounded by um, other folks and other mm -hmm. ideas and, and other sounds and things. So I think you know that is uh, uh, the benefit of what I get to do. It's, it's sort of a, 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 an, and, and that you don't have that, and you have to. You are in the house with her and with our other child, with Jackson, not to mention who needs what he needs. And he's, you know, needs dinner and the stories and needs a bath and he needs homework. And that's all happening as well. Mm -hmm. um, the relief that I have as the parent, my parenting duties are on hold for four hours a night while yours continue to go, can make it easier for me to sort of back off when we are not with them because I'm not with them mm -hmm. every night already. When you leave, it's the rare occasions of someone else doing what you do all the time and for you to be able to say, oh, they'll be fine, is probably not as easy as it is for me. So, you know, I think I am forced every single night to put everything that is happening mm -hmm. in the back. And that doesn't mean that it's always gone. Like I am constantly, you know, I'll be thinking if something specific was happening, if the doctor said something or if, you said something or something was happening, you know, I'll be thinking about it in my brain and have to sort of compartmentalize during some places where I can't really Or focus. I'm sure use it during it's or quiet I, or, uptown. Or I use it or... sometimes, yeah. The, or in the weirdest places, like I, it was during like 
Yorktown or something or some nonstop or something it had nothing to do with my children. And for some reason I thought of Jackson talking to her or saying it, cuddling with her. And I was like, <laughs> and I was like, what are you doing? Like, this is a happy, this is a happy spot. And that's when it gets hard. But, um, I, I, I think, um, so I should ask you a question about, about what we were, you know, what did, when I got to go out and, and I, you know, I got to go do the show and I ran, you know, ran off with all the, my actor friends to do the show at night. You know, I know, what did you do? How did you, how did you sort of come to terms with that and not hate me every time I walked inside the door at, um, when, I, when I got home? Therapy. It took, it took several months of therapy and um, maybe a prescription med thrown in there as well to sort of help with the daily anxiety of all of it. But I sort of had to work through what our new roles were and, um, accept our situation and, and just, you know, just through talking about it with someone, I think having an hour a week where I could just word vomit all of my frustrations and resentment and anger and, you know, life isn't fair, boohoo me. Um, just having that one hour a week really helped until, you know, I could find my feet under me and sort of figure out what my purpose was in all of this and um, and how I fit into this new life and this new marriage where I wasn't the breadwinner anymore. I wasn't um, the one going off to the exciting events and meeting the cool people and, um, you know, this turn as Miguel Cervantes' wife as opposed to, you know, having my own career and identity. Um, and it, it took time and, and a decent amount of therapy. And then, um, and then I, I found myself, I found my purpose with Cure. I found a mission and a job to, um, to keep me going and to, you know, obviously Adelaide gives me incredible purpose, but if I put all of my, um, determining of how successful or how happy I am was based on how Adelaide is doing. That would be a, a, a pretty poor barometer seeing as we have very little control over her condition. So that certainly helped. And, and I think that if I hadn't been able to work through it, I probably would have asked you to come with me to some sessions and requested that we do some couples counseling to try and figure it out together if, if I couldn't have, have come to a solution on my own, but um, I powered through and, and found my feet and here we are. So what advice would you give a family, a parents, a couple who is just getting an epilepsy diagnosis or some, you know, they have a, a special needs child and to keep their marriage strong, to keep their marriage healthy? What's the, the tip that you give them? The first one is to not, to not expect your partner to feel the same way that you do all the time, right? The first one is to, to sort of really allow um, the differences of understanding of like what of what is going on, mm -hmm. you know, because the, the, I think in, in a, in a way, if, if you're not both allowed to sort of get in, get into the, get into the, the get into the, you know, uh, digest what's happening in your own way, then you're always going to be at odds and how to deal with it. And then that's going to sort of mm -hmm. cause a, cause a, cause a problem. I, and, you know, the next thing is once you're, once you're sort of in it, um, like just don't at, don't be afraid to ask for help. Like ask for help. Ask your family. Find out. Like the I I think, and I don't know. Again, this is such a hard thing for me to understand about our situation versus other people's situation. But right. you know, we we for a long time we did it on our own and by we i mean you did most of it and i tried to help when i could and we would get at odds because 
we didn't under, I didn't understand how exactly we didn't have a rhythm mm -hmm. for both of us being involved in a in a in an equal way, and so there was definitely a thing that that was a hurdle we had to get over, and the way we got over it was to hire a nurse, and this nurse came in, and says, wait. You've been doing this all on your own. I would have school for this. Like this is this is the person's full time job, and so then you realize how much, how much it is, how much it, how 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 heavy, what Although it is. I would take that even to the extent for you know, for those who have who maybe aren't quite as disabled as Adelaide, still having that qualified caretaker, that babysitter, that someone, whoever it is, who knows what to do when a seizure happens, who can deliver nighttime meds, who has, even if they're not, you know, an RN, Adelaide needs an RN, and that's just our situation. But not everyone needs that. But having that, you know, qualified caretaker who maybe isn't a family member too, so that you're not always relying on, you know, grandma and grandpa to step in and help that you have, you know, a list, two or three strong people that you can reach out to so that you can get away so that um, you can get that time together. Because if that support system isn't there, then, you know, how do you focus on the marriage? People don't understand, you know, they see a kid in a wheelchair or a kid with crutches or a kid with that special needs or whatever. And I don't think people realize that all around that child is, is a, is a, is a plan of, of care, like this schedule, this unrelenting, um, just the, the timeline goes on and it doesn't stop and you have, and these things have to be done and someone has to do it. Mm -hmm. And if this is a child, then it's the parent's job to do it. And, and, that that happens every single day. Every and minute. Every, of every minute day. of every day. It's You've there. Got to we have to schedule time to be married. And the, you have to schedule in that schedule of medicine. Yeah. You have to schedule time to say, this is also equally as important, if not more important, because if this team is broken, yeah. then how do we take care of this child and keep that team? and our, our son and the rest of our family in line. And I all just, I've heard it from so many people about, you know, make sure you guys are okay because sometimes sicknesses can, can rip, a, rip a marriage apart. In fact, Adelaide's doctor told us that. Yeah. He was like, make sure, make sure you have date nights. Yeah. Well, babe, I love you. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you too. for keeping our, our team in line with me. Listen, thanks for, thanks for keeping me around. <laughs> I hope you understand more about being married with special needs children. But more importantly, what helps Miguel and I keep our relationship strong on this epilepsy journey? Giving up is not a choice for us, both in our marriage and our search for a cure. We love our daughter too much to do anything less. That is why we want to ask you to help us. Please share this podcast with friends and family who face a similar situation. Let them know that they are not alone.